So today the church puts before us two extreme examples. A woman who effectively trampled on money, didn't care about money, and all she wanted to do is to express her love for the Lord. And on the other side, or on the other extreme, a man who should have known better, selling his master for money. And that man, of course, is Judas. So we just let's talk about Judas for a little bit. But before we talk about him, let's just, we need to remember something. The church puts Judas' example in front of us, not to judge him or criticize him, but effectively the church is telling us, be careful here. Be careful. I mean, somebody of that statute, if, if he ends up this way, we need to really be careful right there. And the church is telling us it doesn't matter how you start. It, what matters is how you end. Like we've heard that saying that the race is won at the end. Our church is blessed with so many saints, that's called them saints of repentance, that the beginning was not that good. But what really matters is how they ended. So Judas started really well. I mean, he's, he started really good. He was, he was a disciple, probably left his work, left his family, left his life to follow Christ and followed Christ for so many years. As a matter of fact, very likely he also performed miracles. He did cast out demons. He's seen Christ do some mighty miracles right there. So if anybody who should have known better, it should be Judas. If anybody who knew that Christ was innocent, it's also Judas. And what makes it really tragic is that his betrayal was not on a whim or a, like an impulse. It was planned, it was premeditated, it was intentional. So I think the question here is, how did the disciple end up this way? I mean, what happened right there? And the more important question is, why didn't he repent? He knows, he knows that Christ would accept him back. Why didn't he repent? Let's look at the readings of this morning, third hour of this morning. We know that church, like in her love and her wisdom, provides these readings for us well organized. So the point is not like we don't get, um, these are not random, like here is a part of the prophecy, Old Testament, a gospel, psalm. No, the fact the church organized them very well. If we look at the third hour of this morning, actually the readings provide to us the story, the reason behind that that fall, and how do we avoid that? From Luke 22, which is the third hour of this morning gospel, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So when he went his way and conferred with the chief priests, so he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. The key word here is Satan entered Judas. And I love the way St. Luke put it. He put this in, like, interrupting clause there, who was numbered among the twelve. Remember that St. Luke already gave us the names of the twelve, and one of them was Iscariot. Like early in his, uh, this is uh, chapter 22 and chapter 6, he already gave us the names of the twelve. So if we really read it, it reads like this. Satan entered Judas, so he went his way and did what he, what he needed to do. What is Saint Luke trying to tell us right now? He's basically remind, reminding us that he, that man, one of the twelve fell. So basically, no one is too strong and no one is too good to, to fall. And it all started by us opening a little window for the devil to enter. Like it, the key word is the devil entered Judas. If the devil entered a disciple, we need to be totally careful here. By the way, we got a similar example early in the um, Great Lent of a similar situation with the prodigal son. It reads as follows, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls on me. So here the father divided to them his livelihood. So that's all he wanted is, is my portion of the goods. And then, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed into a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So initially all he wanted was the money. But then we are told that not many days after, 
he picked up and left. So what, what happened in these few days right there? Like, why didn't, I mean, if that was the plan of him leaving, why didn't, why didn't he leave right away? So if a 14th century saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church, St. Gregory Palamas, gives us the answer there. So the devil does not simultaneously suggest to us that we should do what we like and that we should sin. Notice the devil would not come and tell you sin. No, does, the devil does not work like that. Instead, he cunningly beguiles us little by little, whispering, even if you live independently without going to God's church or listening to the church teacher, you will still be able to see for yourself what your duty is and not depart from what is good. So what is St. Gregory telling us right there? The goal or the ultimate goal, the end goal is to get the son out of his father's house. The church fathers tell us the father's house represents the church. That's where the father lives, that's where the father dwells, and that's where the, the, um, his family lives. This is the father of the house. The, 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 the house of the father is the church. And remember also, when the son came back, he had to come back to the father, to, to the church. The salvation is within the church. So when he had to come back, he came back in his filth, in his stench, like he's living with pigs. The church took him back and God cleaned him in the church, like he did not go there, so the salvation is within the church. So the end goal here was to get the son out of, out of his father's house, get him out of the church. What if Satan went and told this kid, or we don't know if he's a kid or not, but went and told his son, why don't we leave your father's house? He would definitely hesit be hesitant, like, um, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna live? Um, I don't have any money. Um, his, we know his father is rich. He has servants, he has animals. Like he, his father is rich. I mean, I'm, I have a good life here. So the devil exercised his plan on more than one step. So step number one, why don't you take the money? I mean, it's yours anyway. Why are you keeping it? Why don't you go and take your money? And then within these few days, there's where the assault of the thought comes. What do you need, your father? I mean, you're raised very, very well. You don't need to be here anymore. You're financially independent. You know better. You're you're a good person, leave. And then we, we all know what happens right there. The first step is to be watchful. Watchful for what? St. Peter tells us, watchful for the devil who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it's, it's a pretty violent metaphor. Like, imagine a lion walking around and devouring somebody. And it's it's intentionally uh, violent, it, because it is violent. It's, for us, it's a matter of life and death. I mean, there are, there are no options. We either live or we either die. And the devil is watching for anybody to snatch and kill. So first step is in being watchful is to watch our thoughts. We'll talk about two things today. First thing, watch our thoughts. So Marty ascetic, he's a fifth century monk. He has some amazing advice on the assault of the thoughts. He has a very decent part on the Philokalia and they have very good advice. He tells us when you sin, blame your thought, not your action. For had not your intellect, like your thought, not run ahead, your body would not have followed. So what is he telling us? Every sin starts with a thought. So you've got a thought that goes ignored, turns into a sin. A sin goes ignored will lead to death. And St. James tells us that when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin which is full grown brings forth death. So that little thought that goes ignored will grow and end up in death. And we have an example in Judas right there. His love of money was the reason he perished. It, it went unnoticed, went unchecked. I'm going to quote St. Mark the Ascetic a couple of times still. So, how does this thought, going unchecked, end up in a sin which ends up in death, God forbid? What St. Mark also tells us that the devil makes small sins seem smaller in our eyes, for otherwise he cannot lead us into greater evil. Every great evil starts with a small sin. Like, the devil would not go and tell somebody, 
commit this huge crime, like a crime like or a sin like murder. How does it start? It starts with a seed of hatred or a seed of envy that goes unchecked, grows eventually into that, like a sin of like fornication or uh, adultery. It starts with a loose eye. It start, still goes unchecked. It starts with a lustful thought that goes unchecked. Eventually, it will lead to that. So these small sins, we need to be careful with. I mean, St. Mark puts it very nicely. It makes small sins seem smaller in our eyes. Otherwise, how is it like the devil will not come and offer you something big. And these thoughts that come to us, there is nothing we can do about it. Like the point is not to stop these thoughts. These are offers from the from the devil. As long as we do not accept that offer, there is no sin there. But the point is to deal with them properly. These are being offered to us. The point here is not th- not to negotiate with it, not to consider it. Any time we start negotiating with the devil or considering a thought or dwelling on it there is a chance that we will not end up in a situation pleasing to God. This is the reality. And Christ gave us a, an example there. He never negotiated with the devil with sitting in any situation. We always hear, he rebuked him. He rebuked him. Very early on, someone got into negotiation with the devil and things did not turn out very well. Eve, when, Eve, when, when, the, um, when, the, ser- when the serpent came to Eve, the serpent came with a lie right away. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Eve took the liberty of correcting the serpent. No, 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 that's not exactly what God said. He said so and so. And then the serpent said, well, you know, I mean, if you eat of the tree, so and so is going to happen. You're going to be like God. And, And the Bible is very clear on when did Eve actually fall. And said, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes, and three beautiful to contemplate, she took its fruit and ate. When did this happen? When the woman started staring at the tree. Mm, looks good, I mean, pleasing to the eye, beautiful. So she started eating. But how did that start? It started with a consideration of that offer from the devil. These offers will always come. We cannot stop them. They will come. But the point is to call on God's help and stop it right there. If we resist the, the devil, he will flee from us. This is the promise. We just, he will eventually, the last thing, he will eventually flee from us. As long as we entertain the, his thoughts, he will just keep on coming. He will just keep on coming. And St. Mark, the ascetic, again tells us, never belittle the significance of your thoughts, because none of them escapes God's notice. Every thought that we have, not every action, every thought that we have, does not escape God's notice. What else we need to do? We need to, we should examine ourselves, particularly the private sins or the hidden sins. Like some sins are public. I mean, people see sins in public, and some sins are hidden. Like if uh, I blew up in anger, or I uh, acted in an unethical way and I got caught, or I lied and I got caught. I need to think about that. Does this bother me more than lying but not getting caught? We, ha- we have to start thinking about that. If I act in an unethical way and I didn't get caught, am I okay with that? Is it only bothering me when I get caught? Or the fact, it's, the fact that I did that is bothering me? And even, I mean, at every level, like if, if I'm a servant in the church, am I expecting credit? Does it bother me that people do not come and thank me and say you're doing such a great job? Thoughts like this can destroy our service if, we, if we're not very careful with stuff like that. Judas' problem, or Judas' sin was a hidden sin. I mean, he loved money. He loved money. But what's even worse in Judas' case is that he tried to wrap it in a righteous wrap. When the woman came with alabaster flask and offered it to Christ, he said, why was this fragment oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? St. John tells us right to him, he did not care for the poor. He was a thief. He said, Judas was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. So what Judas actually, uh, what Judas actually did, or actually what, what he really wanted, he did not care about the poor. He wanted this money to go in the box 
So he would turn around and steal it. That's what he wanted. So it's even a whole new level of a hidden sin that I'm just wrapping it in a righteous, a righteous wrap right there. In the same hour readings, the church tells us how can we avoid that. In Proverbs 4, that's the third hour of Wednesday day, like this morning. That's a beautiful chapter, by the way. I think we should have it mandatory reading for, our, for all our youth. I'll just pick a few things from it, from Proverbs 4. Keep our commandments, forget them not. Go not in the ways of the ungodly, neither covet the ways of the transgressors. Don't, don't like these, uh, their ways. They remove from you a, a deceitful mouth and put away from you unjust lips. Let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids ascend to just things. And there are a lot of amazingly great advice that, that the, the readings provide for us. Now the second major question is, okay, why didn't he repent? I mean, Judas was there when Christ, when Christ told the parable of the prodigal son, and he knows, it's very clear, that God will accept the repentant. As a matter of fact, God will joyfully accept the repentant, not just accept him. He will joyfully accept him. Just imagine this scenario. What if that prodigal son left one more time? He stayed for his father's food, he ate, and then the devil messed with his mind again, and he left again. Disappeared for a few weeks, few months, and came back. What would the father's reaction be? The same exact reaction. He would joyfully take him. If he did it ten times, he would take him ten times. As joyful. So he knows that. He knows that. And actually in the same chapter, Christ tells us that there is joy in heaven over one repentant sinner. Just let's dwell on this image for a second. Imagine countless angels and, and archangels and heavenly hosts rejoicing, worshiping God and giving glory to God because one person repented. This is the power of repentance. And he saw Christ dealing with the repentance. He knows that Christ was very kind with the sinners. He saw him deal with the uh, woman caught in the act. He saw him deal with the uh, Samaritan woman who was like, not living a righteous life by any means. And there is a long list of people. Christ was always kind to them. So why didn't he repent? Why didn't you repent? The fact is, the biggest trick of the enemy, the biggest trick of Satan, is not to make us sin, but to make it hard or put a big barrier for us to come back. Repentance. That is the biggest problem. That it's a hundred times, a million times worse than sinning. Because we just read it right now. It's not about sin. You get up right away. Pick up and get up right away. The devil would come and throw these ideas in our minds like, how can you face God after what you just did? Um, you've gone way too far. Or God's patience is, come on, I mean, how many times are you going to disappoint God? Like, actually, God's patience is definitely running very thin with you right now. It's all, it's all false. We know that this is not the case. God will take us and this is one thing we always stress on for our youth. There is nothing we can do to change God's love for us. There is nothing that you can do that, that will never, it's, it's covenant love. Our love for one another can change, but God's love is covenant love. It will never change. Yeah, we can disappoint God. We can act in a way that's not pleasing to him, but his love does not change. No matter what happens, God's love will not change and he's, he will joyfully take us back. St. John Chrysostom tells us that the devil provides boldness to sin, but shame to repentance. And St. John Chrysostom tells us, be careful, it is the other way around. You should be ashamed when you sin, but you should not be ashamed when you repent. There is no shame in repentance. The heavens will rejoice over your repentance. Let me just close by a quote from Pope Shenouda. He said, if you sin, do not flee from God. But stand before him and tell him frankly of your embarrassment and shame and tell him that you are afraid. Be like the tax collector who, did, who was disturbed by his sin, yet he did not flee, but came with all his sins to God and stood before him in fear and embarrassment. Unable to lift up his eyes, he stood up, he stood afar, beating his breast and cried to God, saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Pope Shruza also tells us in heaven, God will not ask us, why did we sin? But he will ask us, why didn't we repent? May God give us the boldness to repent. May God give us the remembrance that God will always love us and will always accept us. And glory be to God forever and amen.